Hi, this is Andrew Klein, and this is video one of a seven-part video series that is going to cover the basics of uh, how to burn a demo reel, uh, taking your fantastic 3D models that you've made and uh, putting them on DVD so that you can send them to uh, potential employers who will want to hire you for your fantastic 3D modeling skills. Uh, so I'm going to cover the basics of how to get things out of Maya, how to do some uh, work in After Effects to um, stitch parts together uh, and overlay wireframes and things like that, uh, how to do some editing in Final Cut, uh, how to do some uh, work in Compressor to make sure things come out correctly, and uh, also how to use DVD Studio Pro uh, to actually burn the looping auto-playing reel. So uh, first up, of course, I've got here my uh, fantastic 3D model. It's 432 tries. Uh, it already has a texture applied to it. And uh, this is actually an animated texture. And you can see I've already got the model uh, rotating. I'll talk about the rotation in a bit. You don't have to worry about my, uh, my texture there. Uh, but uh, I do have the uh, completed reel that I can show you. Uh, we'll take a look at this just real quick, and you'll kind of see what we're heading towards. I'll tell you, this reel's fantastic. What did I tell you? So that's what we're uh, ending up burning here. That's what we'll be getting to at the end of this. Uh, now I've got all of this set up. Uh, I do want to talk for a minute about my render setup. Uh, first off, I've got a curved backdrop that I've created from a couple of EP curves that I have lofted into a polygon backdrop that's just kind of smooth with the uh, smooth preview, number three button. Uh, it's got a basic white Lambert applied to it. Uh, I have these uh, three reflector planes that I've applied just out of sight of my camera. I'll talk about setting up the camera in just a minute. But uh, they're just out of the frame range of the camera, but they do offer some reflections for any shiny objects, such as the base. Uh, and if you need any final gather cast into the scene, and they can offer a really good job of reflecting light into the scene. Uh, render stats wise, uh, I've made sure to turn off cast and receive shadows on these. Uh, so they're pretty much only visible in reflections and refractions. And if you're using mental ray, uh, all of the mental ray visibility is still on, so it casts final gather elements. I have a couple of lights in the scene. Uh, first off, I have my key light here, which is spotlight shape one. Uh, this is the only light that is uh, casting shadows. And uh, this light uh, is sort of a pale yellow color. Uh, it has an intensity of 0.3. Uh, which is pretty low, mostly because of the final gather contribution that we're using in this case. Uh, I have upped the cone angle pretty wide. I've upped the penumbra angle and drop off to soften out my shadows. And I've given some soft ray trace shadows by enabling use ray trace shadows. Uh, here I've upped the light radius and number of shadow rays to do that. Uh, I have a fill light. This is spotlight shape number two. Uh, this is a sort of pale blue color uh, and has a very low intensity of about 0 0.05. Uh, I've also opened up the cone angle and uh, opened up the penumbra and drop off. So I've got sort of a very uh, soft light shape. There are no shadows on this light. I have a second fill light, which is my directional light shape one. Uh, this light I kind of made a purple color, a very pale purple color. And you can see the intensity for this light is also very low, about 0.1. There are no shadows being emitted from this light. I have a rim light or a backlight. Um, sometimes called a kicker, uh, which is placed behind my object. Uh, this is sort of a peach color. It's uh, intensity of about 0 0.08. Uh, there are no shadows on this light either, and uh, pretty, pretty bright. Now, uh, with this setup, uh, what I've done is uh, I've placed my uh, cube, my base, sort of on this ground. Uh, and if we look at my base, uh, it's really just a cylinder. That's all it is. Uh, the cylinder has a blin, which I've made kind of glossy and reflective. Um, low diffuse, just so it, it feels like kind of a shiny base is all. Uh, and that's kind of my, my model setup overall. Uh, I've placed the cube on the uh, base. In this case, I have it hovering. But if you have a character or something or props, you might want them resting on the base. Um, if you've got certain assets you're trying to highlight, sometimes it's cool to put them slightly off the base. It all depends on the style that you want to show. Uh, I've also got this uh, thing set up already rotating. Now, it's going to have to rotate 360 degrees. And to do this, uh, I've set a keyframe on the rotate Y 
at frame 1, and I've gone to frame 120 and set another keyframe on the rotate Y at a value of negative 360 degrees. Uh, negative 360, so it spins clockwise. Uh, what I usually recommend is that if you're making a reel, have some of your models rotate clockwise and then other models rotate counterclockwise. I think things get kind of boring if your models consistently rotate clockwise or consistently counterclockwise. So it could be advantageous to kind of mix that up a bit. Now, um, you'll notice I did set this uh, key at frame 120. I think that 120 frames is a really good pace so that you don't bore your viewer, uh, that things spin fast enough. Uh, that uh, you can, you know, again, not get bored by waiting for them to rotate all the way around, but also that, um, you know, it's not too fast so that you can't see uh, all the detail. So, uh, again, this is 120 frames of rotation, and I could see anywhere between 110 frames and maybe 150 frames, depending on what you need, but, you know, I've kind of consistently used 120 frames. Uh, you'll notice though that I did kind of clamp my timeline to only 119 frames, and that's because frame 120 is the exact same as frame 1. So instead of re-rendering that frame and making it kind of like stagger every time it gets to that point, uh, I just kind of render out these 119 frames. So that's my basic setup here. I've created a camera, which can be found under uh, Create Cameras Camera, and I have gone ahead and placed that camera by going into it. Panels Perspective Camera 1. Uh, once I've placed it, I actually selected all my channels in the channel box, right-clicked, and chose Lock Selection. That way, no matter how hard I try, I can't move my camera and accidentally sort of get it off course. Now, I have turned on a couple of things here in my camera so I can know exactly where I'm filming to. Uh, first, I've turned on the resolution gate, which in the viewport uh, status bar is a little blue ball. Um, here, you can see an outline showing you where you're rendering to. And notice that I've cropped the base. You don't really need to show the whole base. Just frame right on your model. That's all you really need to see. That's all employers would want to see if they're trying to take a look at your work. Don't show the base. You didn't spend as much time modeling the base. Uh, in this case, maybe I spent more time modeling the base, but that is not an important point. Moving on. Uh, I've also turned on my action safe window, and anything inside this little guideline is safe for there to be action. And I've also turned on the T, which is my title safe. Anything inside this window is safe to kind of place text. So uh, what happens on uh, traditional TVs is that the edge of the frame is sometimes cropped a little bit. Uh, and uh, not, not so the case on more, more of the uh, modern flat screen TVs, but you never know who's watching this, so you want to make sure that you have everything inside those uh, action and title safe boundaries. Here my cube is placed square in the center. Uh, that is a horrible pun, I'm sorry, but uh, enjoy. Um, I'm going to go back to my perspective view. And, uh, you know, sort of here's what I've got. Now, as I said earlier, my, uh, my lights are kind of dim. And the reason for this is because uh, most of my illumination is coming from Final Gather contribution. If I go into uh, Mental Ray, which I'm rendering with, uh, under Features, I have turned on Final Gather. And this is causing uh, extra bounce light contribution. What it's actually doing is it's taking the environment color of the camera that I'm rendering from and blending that into the scene. So in my camera shape nodes environment section, I've set my background color to like a pale sky blue as well, and that's going to add extra blue into the render when I render this out. I've gone into the quality tab and make sure to set my quality presets at production, which is what things are at right now. That way I have these optimized ray trace settings. And um, then I can go into my common tab. Now, I've already set my project for this scene uh, by going to File, Set Project before I start. And I set this to this demo vid uh, folder that I've got set up previously with an images, uh, scenes, and source images folder uh, that I'm using for this project. So make sure you do set your project directory first before rendering. Now, if you set your project directory, uh, it's going to send your images uh, that you render out directly into this images folder. Now, uh, that will sort of like just name this based on your scene file. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create a special subdirectory. And with this, uh, I'm going to, in my file name prefix section in the common tab, hold down right click and I'm going to choose insert layer name, render layer. And this is going to make a folder for me when I hit backslash. And then I can name my file something like cube actually wrong slash direction there we go uh, I want the forward slash um, so this is um, 
going to be in the images folder. It's going to render to the master layer folder and then create my files as cube.number.extension. And uh, that's what we'll have here. Uh, I'm creating these master layer folders because in the next video I'm going to create separate render layers to composite my ambient occlusion and to do my wireframe rendering. Uh, you'll notice that I've set my image format to TIFF. I recommend either TIFF or Targa as your renderable format. They're both uncompressed. Uh, I usually do TIFFs, however. Uh, my frame animation extension should always be name.number.extension for uh, video formats that you're going to try and put together like this. Uh, so that's name.number.extension. My frame padding is 3 because I have 3 digits in the number of frames that I'm rendering out. This will render it out as cube.001 instead of if I just have a uh, 0 frame padding uh, cube dot one. Uh, this extra frame padding helps make sure that your images sort of are sorted in an easy to find way when you have them rendered out to your desktop or whatever location you're rendering to. My start frame and end frame. Well, I'm starting at frame one. I'm ending at frame 119. That's how long it takes to rotate. And I'm rendering every frame in between there, rendering by frame one. Uh, I'm rendering from my camera one, not my perspective camera. So make sure you have that set. Then in your image size custom, you want to set um, some very specific elements up. Now, if you're rendering to HD, you can just set HD 720 or HD 1080. However, uh, if you're rendering to a DVD size, you might want to start with 640 by 480. Problem with 640 by 480 is that's not actually the resolution that um, you will have uh, on a DVD screen. I want to show you a couple of renders here. This is 640 by 480 at a pixel aspect ratio of 1. Looks pretty good. But a DVD uh, is actually going to stretch this. So if I send that down, you'll kind of see what we have here. This is a 640 by 480 at a pixel aspect ratio of 1. Here's a 640 by 480 at a pixel aspect ratio of 0.9. So if I render this out, You'll notice that my cube looks very sort of stretched. Now, if I burn my uh, video to DVD, uh, DVDs uh, have a compression ratio that's actually going to create a pixel aspect ratio, I should say, that is uh, 0.9, or 0.91 to be more precise. But uh, that's actually going to stretch your footage, and you're going to get this sort of like elongated look instead of the uh, correct stretch size that you want. Uh, to counter for this, uh, recommend doing a width of 720 by 480. And you notice you're going to get a more square cube, pretty much. And you can see sort of like the different stretching that you have here. Now, if you set your pixel aspect ratio to 1 for this, 720 by 480. This can even work fine for you as long as you're making sure the rest of your settings and After Effects and Final Cut are correct by the time we get to DVD Studio Pro. Now what I'm going to recommend, if you guys are out there rendering uh, DVD footage uh, or trying to put your footage onto a DVD, here's what I'd recommend so far at this step. I would recommend rendering your width as 720, your height as 480, and your pixel aspect ratio as 1. We're going to change the rest of our settings later and make sure everything works with this. So I think this is going to give me the sort of like squarest look for my square cube that I could possibly ever want. Uh, let's go right into my camera and we should be able to test this. We'll just kind of see a face or a rotational angle that's facing right towards us. Let's render this out. Let's make sure that this feels kind of square. This is one of those drop frames in my texture. So this actually does feel kind of square. Uh, I'm liking this. Uh, I think we are good. Um, again, if I render this at 0.9, this is going to stretch this out a bit. So don't go ahead and change these sorts of things here. Again, my recommendation is 720 by 480 at a pixel aspect ratio of 1 go one frame further along because for some reason my texture my image sequence is like dropping a texture frame when it uh, plays through so there we can see it with the texture on so I think this kind of gives us a really good uh, view to work with and uh, we should have everything that we need ready to go so this has been video one. Uh, what we're going to cover in video two is how to create some additional render passes that we can utilize uh, for compositing, how to create occlusion and wireframe, and we'll put those together in After Effects. So uh, stay tuned for that video.